Okay, so next we're going to talk about mem objects. Um, let's see, what do I have? So this is an object that interacts somehow with Gem 5's memory system. And this is, you have to use mem objects to get the ports interface to work. And this is um, both the classic caches and Ruby is a mem object. Um, the classic caches and the crossbars, et cetera, are all, each one of these are mem objects. So you can connect them up in really flexible ways. Um, Ruby is one big mem object. But the, uh, all the inputs to Ruby from cores are ports, and the output to memory is also ports. But Ruby is one big mem object. Um, so mem objects can have these master ports and slave ports. Um, and they're really the only things that have master ports and slave ports are mem objects. So now we need to talk about how you shuttle data across these ports. And that's via packets. Um, these are the units of transfers between mem objects. Um, they pass between the master and slave ports. Um, the same packet traverses the whole way. So when you send, when the CPU sends a request packet out, it expects to get the exact same packet um, back later as a response. Packets have a request, and this request is um, what you want, the address, and uh, the command, not the command, the address and the address type, whether it be like a read or a write, um, and there are lots of other request types. A command, and this command is like a read request is a command, and Often, read requests get converted into read responses, which is a different command, um, for the same packet. So you convert a packet from a request to a response, and that changes the command. Um, packets also contain the data, um, and lots and lots more. You can see everything that's in packets and requests if you look at source mem packet.hh or request.hh. OK, so let's talk about the way masters and slave ports interact. Um, those of you that come more from the double E side, probably know some of this. As someone who's coming from CS, this was a little bit weird to me for a while. So, and this is to be talking about the API. So these are all the actual API calls. So a master calls send timing request, which is gonna send a request to the slave. This sends a packet uh, containing, that contains a request from the master to the slave. This in turn calls receive timing request on the slave side. So as a slave, you have to implement receive timing request. Then this returns whether or not the slave can handle it. Let's say it returns true, the slave can handle that request. Great. So now the slave does whatever it needs to do to handle the request. You know, maybe it enqueues an event to wait some latency because it's a cache hit. Or maybe it forwards the request on because it can't handle it. But it does whatever it needs to do. And then sometime later, the slave is going to call send timing response with the same packet object. So this means the slave is done processing and it's going to send a response. And you've converted the packet from a request to a response before calling send time response. This in turn calls receive timing response on the master side. So this is again a function that you have to implement if you are implementing a master. Uh, and again, like receive timing request, this returns true or false whether or not the master can currently handle this response, and if it returns true, then this whole exchange is done. However, these can return false. So if a slave returns false, that means the slave cannot currently process the packet. Maybe it's processing something else. Um, something's going on. And so by returning false, you say, resend the packet at some later time. And the master is responsible for tracking this packet, and it's responsible for sending it at a later time. So the slave is busy for some amount of time. And then at some point, the slave becomes unbusy. And whenever it becomes unbusy, it needs to call send request retry, which in turn, which tells the master it can retry the packet. And this calls receive request retry on the master side. So you have to implement receive request retry. So receive request retry, then usually just call send timing request again with the same packet that the master was uh, tracking. And then maybe receive timing request returns true. Maybe it actually returns false because someone beat you to take whatever um, resource was necessary. So you can sit here in this loop and that times. Um, questions so far? Yeah. 
So is this player responsible for sending, sending back the re retry, or can the master just wait for a The slave is responsible to, the slave must call send re request retry. Okay, so the slave needs to keep track of who's actually sent me a request. Yes, so I can yes, respond yes, that's right. The slave needs to remember um, who needs to, who it needs to send retry requests to. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. And the same thing can happen the other direction. You can the slave can call send timing response and receive request or receive timing response can possibly return false, which the master is busy, and at some point the master then sends a response retry to the slave, which means the slave can now um, send it. So if you're implementing a slave, you need to implement receive response retry, um, and it works exactly the same way. Any questions on that really quick master slave port intro? No? So this is only for classic? So this is um, all of the classic caches and classic memory systems uses this. Ruby also uses it in a limited sense. This is not how you communicate between caches in Ruby, but it's how the CPU communicates to Ruby and how so I wish I had a board. Yeah, it's so hard to teach without a board. Um, so with Ruby, it looks like you have your CPUs up here. They send ports down into Ruby. Ruby is a big black box, which models some cache coherence protocol. And then on the other side of Ruby, you have memory down at the bottom. So then there's ports interface between Ruby and memory, and between the CPU and Ruby. Within Ruby, God knows what happens. It's just, it's a black box. I know what happens, but that's not something easily explainable. Yeah? So I, I want to implement cache coherency. I have to use Ruby, or I can? Um, so the classic caches provide cache coherence. Okay. So you can have multiple CPUs with multiple caches in the classic caches. It is Mosey coherence, and you can't change it at all. It, it, it's baked in, whatever it is. It's kind of snooping, kind of not, kind of magic. It's actually snooping with snoop filters nowadays. It does have snoop filters, yeah. but there are still some magic things that happen. Yes. Uh, it is not a full, detailed implementation of a cache coherence protocol. Ruby, has the Ruby is what provides detailed cache coherence protocol implementations. Okay, so this interface. Uh, on the master, you have to implement these three functions and a few others. Um, uh, no, just. Those. Master, you have to implement these functions. Slave, you have to implement these. So we talked about um, some of these. The other ones on, over on the slave, you have to implement to receive functional. So functional requests are, um, some people argue a better name would be debug instead of functional. But it's used for like an SE mode loading in the binary from the host into the uh, simulator. You receive functional requests to load all that stuff into memory. Functional could also be used to inspect so the way functional works is you get, um, you get a request, and you just have to make sure that it functionally happens everywhere in the system. So if it's a write, every valid copy of that block needs to be written. If it's a read, you have to go find the canonical version of that block and return the value. Um, and then this get address ranges and receive range change, range change allows the uh, classic memory system, the crossbars, to know what ports respond to what addresses. So you have to implement those as well. They're usually pretty simple to implement. So with that, let's create a simple memory object. Um, so we're going to take our hello object and turn it into a simple memory object. So we're going to set, have a CPU, a mempus, um, and a memory controller, and then stick our memory object right in between the mempus and the CPU. So we can do, um, so we can see how to implement this. So with that, Let's start doing it. And this, we'll slowly go through the slide as we implement the whole API. Um, okay, so first. We need to add parameters to the sim object to declare the ports. We need to add the ports to the sim object description file. So in here, 
Let's also add an instruction port for the instruction port of the CPU. This is going to be a slave port because it's going to receive requests from the CPU. I would say almost always. I hesitate to say always. But almost always, you're not going to have a default value for these ports. Uh, and it, that makes sense, right? Because this is how you get flexibility in your configuration script to hook things up um, however you want. So that's why it doesn't make sense to have defaults. We have a data port, which is basically the same thing. Um, and then a mem side port. I'm going to call it mem side. Yep, I'm not going to change the name. That's not a very good name. But not changing. And it's going to be a master port because it's going to send requests to the memory system. So we've declared the uh, three ports that we saw in that picture before. Okay. So now the fun part. Fun for some people. So we're going to convert our hello object instead of a sim object. We are now going to make it a mem object. So we're going to import include mem object instead and do public mem object. Mem objects are some objects. Um, we'll leave the rest of this the same. So we need to um, define two ports, the CPU side port and a memory side port. So starting with the CPU side port, It's going to be a slave port. Um, it's going to have one member, which is the hello object, which owns this port. And then everything else in here is just going to be the interface that we have to implement which I showed on that slide a moment ago. First, the uh, constructor. So you have to have a name for your port because the slave port requires a name. Um, and then slave port also requires a memory object, which is the owner of this port. So we also need to pass a pointer to owner. And then we will also initialize the owner. That's our constructor. And then the other functions that we need to implement um, receive timing request packet pointer. Packet. Uh, I did leave out one. We also need to implement receive atomic, but we are not going to implement that. Um, so briefly, Gym 5 has a couple convenience functions um, for erroring. One is panic which means something went wrong in the simulation, like something went wrong in your code that you didn't expect. Um, 
and the other one is fatal, which means there was something that the user did in the config file, which is wrong, usually. Fatal is something the user did wrong. Uh, panic is something that you didn't expect to happen at a high level. So we also need receive functional. And receive response free try. And these you can use over or you should use override here, but I'm not gonna go back and do it. So this is the um, whole, the, all the API that we need to implement to implement a CPU side port. Um, MEM side port is pretty similar. I'm going to go ahead and define that here too. But it's going to be a master port. and have an owner, a constructor, which looks basically the same. <coughs> Call the master ports constructor with the name. For this API, we need three functions, which are receive timing <coughs> response, and you're not going to return a book, <laughs> um, receive request retry. and receive range change. Cool. So that was fun. Any questions so far? I think my chances of typos are going up a lot right now. Okay, so we have these two we have defined these two classes. Um, now we need to use them. So we're gonna have three ports in our object. Um, a CPU side port that we're gonna call instaport. A CPU side port we're gonna call it data port. And a mem side port, which we are gonna call mem port. So these are going to be instantiations of these classes that we created here. And finally, since we're a mem object, we have to implement the mem object interface, um, which consists of two functions. Get master port, which takes a String and an ID, um, which we won't really talk about this ID. Um, I talk about it in one of the chapters in the book. So it takes two parameters and then same for Slave port, except with the word slave.
So these functions um, get master port and get slave port are what's called when you put that equal sign in Python. So if you say one port equals another port, these two functions get called, um, and we'll see how they're implemented here in a second, um, which then return eventually references to these things to get things all connected up. Any questions? Okay. So let's um, start by implementing the um, get master port and get slave. Before we do that, let's finish this constructor to con make sure to construct these um, ports correctly. So. The ints port takes two parameters, a name, and its owner. So um, here we're using params name, which this is automatically populated as whatever the variable name is in Python for this hello object we created. So in our example so far, it would be hello JSON. So that's params name, and then dot and then the name that we call this in Python, and the Python can, uh, Python sim object declaration is this dot inst port, uh, and that's the name of our port. Data port is similar, and then mem port. We call this mem side for some reason. So again, these need to match whatever you called it in the sim object declaration file. Okay, so those are all constructed. Um, now let's define these two functions. So we're going to return a base master for it reference from get master port. So what this function does is this function gets past some name. You check to see if that name is the name that you're expecting. And if it is, return the port. Otherwise, um, send it up the chain to see what happens. So if the interface name is memside, return memport. Otherwise, return, we're going to call the parent function, memobject, get slave. Um, I talked about this um, in the cache chapter, but this, I, this port IDX um, is used for vector slave ports and vector master ports. So you can have any number of ports in a vector, and then this ID would identify which port it is in the vector. Um, it's a little bit complicated, and you can read more in that chapter. Why are we getting slave port? Oh, because I mistyped it. Because I'm getting tired. Because these functions look so similar that it's really hard not to do that. Um, okay, so then similarly for slave port, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, returning a slave port. We get slave port. So here, we have two things to check. So if the interface name is inst port, return inst port. 
Files if it is data port. Return data port. Else send it up to our parent. Okay, cool. So we implemented the mem object interface. Any questions here? No, there's not much to have questions on at this point. Um, okay, <coughs> so the next step is starting to implement some of the actual interface between things. So I'm going to do a couple of these which are really simple. So from the CPU side, it can, we need to implement get address ranges. That's going to call get address ranges in our simple mem opt, or hello object in this case, which is then going to call get address ranges on the mem site port. So we're just going to send this straight through. Similarly, for receive range trains, we're going to send it straight through to the other side. And functional, we're just going to send it straight through. So now we need to implement these nine functions real fast. Um, what time? Where are we in time? Okay, let's dive into it. So, let's start with get address ranges. So on the CPU side port, we need to implement get address ranges. And this is going to call something on the owner side. So it's going to call this owner get address range, which we'll define in a second. So Address ranges. Const for some reason. <coughs> and we'll print that we're doing this just for fun and then return an import get address ranges. Okay, one down. What about receive functional? So, hello object, CPU side port, receive functional of a packet. Return owner handle function. And if I remember right in the chapter after this when we go over caching, receive handle functional starts to become a little bit more complicated. Um, so now to implement handle functional, So functional is actually just a whole call chain that goes through the um, through the whole memory hierarchy to figure out where it needs to functionally do updates or get data from. 
Um, so if this object was holding any state or anything, it would need to check the packet and see if it needed to update its state or read from its state. Um, OK. So then we'll quickly do the range change things. Hello, object, mem side port, receive range change. And for the owner. So we want, if we get a range change from the memory side port, we need to send a range change to both the inst port and the data port. So I send a range change first to that port. Okay. So what this would do, um, if this object cared about range changes, or if these ports care about range changes, when you get a send range change, then you would call this get address range after that to get what the new address range is. But we don't really care at all about ranges because we're <coughs> going to deal with all address ranges in our system. Yeah. A range is an array, it's a range of addresses. So we did like an address range. Um, for our system was 0 to 512 megabytes. It could also, there can be really complex ranges. There can be like interleaved ranges where it's, you know, 0 to 4 gigabytes for every other block or something. So you can have complex ranges as well, interleaved um, with different bits. Any other questions? Oh, this is um, a little bit slow, isn't it? So before we forget, um, let's change this header file to add these functions that we're using. So let's see, how, how many functions did we have here? We had address range list get address ranges. We had void handle functional. And we had void send range change. While I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and add the other functions that we needed to add, which are bool handle request. And bool handle response, I think. Yes. Okay. Cool. So now we're going to go through the request path now. So this is what we're going to implement. When we get a time, timing request, we're going to call handle request. It's going to check to see if this is blocked. We're only going to allow a single packet outstanding at a time. So this is like a fully blocking cache kind of thing. So if it's blocked, you're going to return false. Otherwise, we're going to set block to true and call send packet on the mem side port. This send packet function, we're going to add and it's going to take care of all of um, handling whether or not packets can be sent or not. So it's going to call send timing request. If this fails, then it's going to save the packet and then receive request retry. It's just going to try to send the packet again. So really simple little um, flow control. So we're going to do this. And I have a feeling we're not going to have time to do the other direction, which is unfortunate, but it's mostly the same. So 
Let's start with receive timing request. So, bool. Hello, object. CPU side port. Receive timing request. So, we'll see why I split this up into an if statement here in a minute. So if the owner can't handle the request, we're going to return false. Otherwise, return true. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll do this right now. So also, if the owner can't handle the request, we're going to save some information that we need. Oh. We're going to remember that we need to retry at some time in the future if the owner can't handle the request. OK. So then. Um, Let's do handle request. So if we're blocked, we're going to return false. Otherwise, Got request for an address. I'm going to print this address. Oops, backwards. Packet. Get address. That's the address of the request. And then we're going to set block to be true. And then. Send the packet on the mem port and then return true. So, it's basically if we're not blocked, we can always accept the request, um, is one of the things we're saying. So, first, send packet. On the mem side port, we're going to have this send packet function. And it's going to be void because we don't care what it returns. We assume that it's going to handle all the flow control itself. <clears throat> then we're going to call send timing response, or request, sorry. <laughs> call send timing request of this packet. If it fails, we're going to save this packet for later. So then, finally, we're going to implement receive request retry. Assert that we that we have this block packet. And then grab the packet.
make sure we have somewhere to put it in case this send time that send packet fails again and call send packet. So this is the full through the um, all the way through the receiving a request side. Um, due to time, I'm not going to run through the next one, but the response is a similar thing. All, all the code is almost the same for responses. Um, there's just a couple little things that need that are different, um, and let me pull that up real fast. Um, all this code is on, um, is available to download on the website and uh, somewhere in GitHub too. So on the other side, um, I'm going to look at handle response. So first, we have to know which port to send the packet back on. We have to send it back on the right port. So in this case, since we know we're going to be connected to an instruction port and a data port, we can use whether or not this was the packet was an instruction to know which port to send it back on. Um, but if you don't have that, you might actually have to store a map to remember where to send packets back. Um, and then the other thing we have to do is when we receive a response, we get unblocked. So at that point, now we need to tell these CPU ports that they can send, um, we need to call um, send request retry on these ports. But we, can on we only do that if we know that they actually need to retry. So there's these helper functions, um, try, send, retry, on the CPU set port, um, which simply checks to see if we need to retry and only sends a retry if we need to retry, both if we need to retry and we're actually not blocked. So with that, you have a fully working memory object. And after you spend that almost 45 minutes to an hour watching me code that, you'll never have to code it again because you can just copy paste it and use it other places. All right. Okay, so let's see if there's anything else I wanted to cover there. And there might be a couple things. Uh, yeah, so any, any questions about memory objects? Yeah. So it seems like uh, the ports largely just or refresh between memory objects. Yeah, so the ports, the ports are like this, and it's like over here. There's like two peer port and two peer port. That's what the ports are. And then this stuff here, while it was really boring in this example because we were just forwarding back and forth, this is where all the meat of a sim object's code would be. Um, so if you're a cache, in handle request is where you would implement the cache part. And in handle response is where you would like insert things into the cache, for instance. And um, in the book, we, I actually implement a full unit processor cache uh, building off of this code here. So is there kind of a predefined port that we can just use, or do we need to do this? Possibly? You need to do this whole thing every single time. Okay. Um, that's the short answer. And the reason is that you know most objects are going to have different ways to do flow, flow control, depending on what the object is. The flow control really matters on an object per object basis. Yeah. There are some ways you can cheat. There are these queued ports, which um, allow you to totally ignore this flow control in a queue port, but they have infinite queuing in them. So if you care at all about back pressure, 
um, and really modeling any kind of bandwidth. You can't use a two port. One of the places where it's okay is, for instance, the DRAM controller uses a Q port for responses. That's okay because all the path pressures would happen on the request side. The responses, surely the cache receiving responses is going to be lower bandwidth than it's sending responses to the DRAM controller, for instance. And there's a couple other um, ports that um, are already implemented, um, which could be useful for functional only things. I think a translating port, for instance, that translates uh, virtual to physical. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I know it's a lot of boilerplate code. I wish there was a way for me to present it in a slightly more interesting way. Um, but it's important boilerplate code that you actually need to understand and need to use every single time you make a MIM object. And hopefully this will help you understand when you look at these MIM objects how the flow control is happening. Um, you know, I tried to encapsulate most of the flow control in the actual port definitions themselves. Not all objects do that. Any other questions here on imports? Yeah. So I think like it's very easy to get the diagonal on the step. Okay. Um, what would you do if you got some connection incorrect and your system is not working correctly? Lot so um, because I was coding this quickly, a uh, couple things. One, defensive programming. Use lots of asserts. And then uh, there's also this panic if that you can use, which is kind of like an assert, but a little bit more flexible. There's lots of defensive programming, lots of deep apps. So like as I code, I put in all sorts of deep apps. And then when something doesn't work, I turn on the debug flag and trace through to see what's going on. Um, you know, as far as like getting things mixed up here, for the most part, you would notice when you compiled, it would be pretty angry at you. Um, but yeah, th this is hard. And even when I was implementing this simple mem object, uh, it worked fine with the simple timing CPU, but as soon as I hooked up the O3 CPU and there were multiple requests at the same time, everything broke. And especially, it gets especially hard when you're trying to track down these flow control issues. Lots of deep apps is all I can say. And D GDB is really helpful too. Yeah? Uh, so, Uh, yeah, it's up to you. Um, it's just packets that come in, and then up to your memory object how you handle reads and writes. So, you know, say you wanted to, reads were twice as fast as writes. You would delay for half the time on reads that you did on writes. Um, and again, the cache has better examples of that. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I have a few more slides about uh, some higher level Gen 5 stuff. Um, but while I'm going through these, think about any other questions that you might have just on Gen 5 in general. And we can spend a few minutes at the end talking about that. So um, like I said, in this, other, th this next chapter, basically the last chapter in the book right now, um, it has a full implementation of uniprocessor cache, a blocking uniprocessor cache. So it takes all this code that we were just looking at, but adds a cache um, to it. Um, it sh shows some good emulation concepts of like, when you're doing this kind of simulation, you can cheat really good. So for instance, I just used an STL map to store everything in the cache. So it's fully associative STL map. Um, and so you can cheat like that, but you have to be careful, make sure you're cheating in ways that it's okay to cheat in. So you still need to model the delay of accessing the associated um, and then this also covers how to use vector ports, how to use clocked objects, um, and then upgrading and creating packets. So for instance, if you get a 64-bit request from the CPU, but you need to insert a whole block into the cache, you have to upgrade that to a 64-byte request to send it to um, memory. If you're looking for a good project to really get your feet wet in this kind of stuff, I would suggest taking this code I have for a blocking cache and making it non-blocking adding MSHRs to it. That would be, it is, it'll be surprisingly complicated. Um, but I think it'd be a really good exercise. I haven't done it, so maybe it's actually really hard. I don't know. Okay, um, so 
a random assortment of other Gem5 things. So Gem5 supports a ton of ISAs. Um, ARM, uh, as an x86 user, I'm sad to say, ARM is probably the best supported ISA in Gem5. Um, and that's thanks to ARM research. Uh, we got lots of contributions there, and it's really stable, works well. You can expect most things to work when you're using ARM. Um, x86, the implementation is very complicated. I was telling some about a bug that I just ran into in the x86. No, the ISA still has bugs in it sometimes. Um, but it's x86, so it's really useful when you're sitting in an x86 machine. You don't have to cross compile or anything like that. Um, Risk v was just a recent contribution. We have SE mode working. If you're interested in Risk v and want to get full system mode working, that would be amazing. Um, thanks to Alec at UVA who implemented all the Risk v stuff. So I think that's really exciting that we have um, Risk v support now. Um, and then we also have Alpha, and MEPS, Spark, and Power, all of which are never maintained and hardly supported. But we have them. How much do you love Alpha, Steve? Why? <laughs> <laughs> so, how much do you love Alpha? Alpha would be nice if it was still around. <laughs> um, lots of CPU models. So, we looked at the uh, simple timing CPU. Um, but a couple others that are useful. So the atomic simple CPU runs in atomic memory mode, and this is useful for warming up your caches or fast forwarding. Um, the O3 CPU is an out of order model. Um, it's highly configurable, but be careful because the default configuration is not reasonable. Um, if you use the O3, make sure you've tuned it to something, or convince yourself that it's a reasonable processor before you start. Um, doing experiments with it. Minor CPU is an in-order model. Um, it works fully with ARM and is not tested fully with x86, so your mileage may vary. Um, and I've heard that it well emulates a lot of ARM processors. And then there's the KVM CPU, which is super cool. It has x86 and ARM support. It actually uses the um, virtualization technology in current processors to run, at nat run in Gen 5 at native speeds. This is very useful for fast forwarding or for testing or for um, getting full system mode up and running. For instance, with, you know, with timing, Linux takes like um, uh, maybe seven or eight minutes to boot. With Atomic, maybe four or five minutes to boot. O3, it takes 20 or 30 minutes to boot. KVM, it takes about two seconds. It's really nice for getting things up and running. I highly encourage you to look at that if you have. Yeah. Uh, so in the full system mode, can we boot using the KVM and then switch to another? Yes, you can. All that is um, configurable in Python. So we can like get a checkpoint using the KVM and then restore from the checkpoint. Yep. Or you can just switch. Um, you know, switching back and forth between KVM and detailed models. It used to work. Sometimes works. Sometimes doesn't. It used to be really, really reliable. So it might work for it might work for uniprocessors. It does not work for multiprocessors. Oh, okay. Um, but yes, so, um, I've, there's some scripts somewhere in GitHub. If you start poking around on my um, page for a while, that have full support for sampling, where you fast forward with KVM and take random samples during execution, and. In fact, I think that actually has multiple levels. It's a two-level sampler. You fast forward to a point, take X number of random samples at that point. So, uh, yeah. And all this is done via Python. You can write these Python configuration files that do anything you want. It's really amazing. Yeah? And this is not supported with Ruby, right? Ruby, Ruby checkpoints, I think, only with ARM. So Ruby checkpoints is um, complicated. First Ruby and KVM. Um, you cannot use the exact same system to simulate. You can't um, switch back and forth between KVM and detailed mode if you're using Ruby. Should be able to. It would be a relatively easy thing to implement. No one's done it yet. Um, checkpointing in Ruby. Yeah. You need to checkpoint with a certain protocol, but then you can restore the checkpoint with any protocol. Okay. Checkpointing in Ruby is useful. 
because unlike the classic caches, when you checkpoint in Ruby, you save all the cache state. So then when you restore the checkpoint, the caches are actually warm. Unlike in classic, um, caches are always cold when you restore from a checkpoint. Okay, so um, this was alluded to a number of times. Um, full system support is really great. I would strongly encourage you to always use full system mode in your experiments. Um, it models a lot more things. There are, SE mode takes some bad little hacks, like it does not model a TLB. So if you think that the TLB misses matter at all for your application, you should be using full system mode. So I think there's some work in that from uh, AMD. So there is support for physical emulation mode and KVM. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. actually emulates the. That's TLB. true. Well, so the TLB is emulated, right. but not time. Emulated. Right. Okay. Yep. It, it's not emulated. It, it's emulated, but not time. Sorry. Um, what I meant to say was that that emulates the page table, and then if you right. use that functionality in simulation, you get the full TLB. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't realize that. Um, so full system mode, Gen5 exposes a bare metal interface, but you need to have uh, Linux kernel compiled, disk images, etc. Um, so this part three has a simple, uh, an x86 example of a configuration script to get things going um, that is pretty well commented. I tried to put comments saying what everything was doing, except for this one function, which is set up full system mode, which just has all the devices and everything you need to get x86 full system going. Um, and then I have a, a post on my blog recently, which is not well tested, but it's up there that might help you, that goes through the steps of creating disk images and compiling kernels for Gen 5. Um, so, the thing, the way that I went through it was I did everything in QEMU to get everything set up and going and connect to the internet and everything, and then you can take that directly and load it in the Gen 5 after you've got your system that you want. So we talked some about um, coherence. Um, so the big differences between the classic caches and Ruby. So classic just models Mosey and is mostly snooping based. Um, Ruby, you can model any protocol, snooping, directory, tokens, whatever you want. Um, classic is a hierarchical protocol. And that's pretty much the only thing that allows. Ruby, you can do anything you can imagine. Um, you can do in your protocol in Ruby. Classic's really flexible. It's really easy to stick a third level of cache in Classic. Or, you know, use bank caches in Classic, or et cetera. But in Ruby, your cache hierarchy, whether you have like an L1, L2, so like private L1, private L2, or private L1, shared L2, that kind of stuff is baked into the coherence protocol, which makes sense. It kind of has to be. But that means whenever you're using these Ruby protocols, they're not flexible. And it's really hard to just throw in an L3 cache, for instance. Classic um, provides a, a good baseline for most of your chip multiprocessor studies. So if you don't care how the coherence protocol is implemented, use Classic. If you're modifying the coherence protocol, use Ruby. If what you care about is coherence, Ruby is your answer. Um, you can see a bunch of protocols in um, source min protocols. Slick is what these protocols are written in. It's a domain-specific language for coherence. Um, there's not much documentation. I'm sorry. Um, but there are lots and lots of examples in there. Some good, some bad. Good luck trying to figure out which is which. Um, writing more about how to use Ruby is on my to-do list, but it is unfortunately relatively low on my to-do list. So a question about Ruby. You mentioned that it's fairly inflexible if you want to add cache levels and stuff. But say that you want to add another master, like another CPU. Uh, yeah, so as okay. long as you're, if you're adding another, just a, more CPUs, it's fine. Okay. Uh, no problem. You can add more controllers, but you can't change what the controllers are. Right. And another thing about the interconnection between the controllers, in the Ruby I believe that you can use any. Yeah, so, yeah, that's true. Ruby interconnect is very flexible. Um, the classic interconnect is basically crossbar based interconnects. Um, Ruby, you can do crossbars, point to point, mesh. Um, there's one called cluster, which makes clusters and then does crossbars between clusters. Um, yeah, it's very flexible. And then there's two different network models in Ruby. There's the simple network model and also Garnet, which is a much more detailed network model. Um, yeah, it's, 
complicated. There's a lot of code there. But it does a good job for what it does. Um, we can talk more about it offline, but yeah. j just at a, as a quick general statement, um, the Ruby topologies assume some protocol often. So again, like if you want to set up a mesh, it, you have to know which controller is going at which location in the mesh. So it's not very flexible. Um, and especially when you're using command line parameters for SE or FS.py, you're not going to get what you expect when you just use command line parameters. I almost guarantee you. But in general, you said that panic error means that you're not expecting so it's yeah. a configuration or? Yeah, it's really hard. To, with, with Ruby, it's hard to say. Okay. Um, but again, like it, if you're doing Ruby and you're stepping just a little bit out of the norm, mm -hmm. I would strongly encourage you to write a configuration file from scratch. It's going to be hard because no one's done it in Ruby ever. Um, so there's not much scaffolding there, but I, I really think that's the right way to go about it. OK, um, quickly, since we're kind of out of time, there's a bunch of device models. Um, there's a GPU model that AMD recently released, which runs HSAIL. There's a bunch of devices for full system simulation, including Ethernet, which allows multi-system simulation, um, IDE controllers, a no Mali GPU, which allows you to run graphics things, even without a graphics. Uh, even without a GPU. Um, but most of these devices are functional only. They have a little bit of timing components, but they don't model anything real. So be careful if you care about the timing of devices. For instance, the IDE controller, there's just no timing. Um, and then there's a bunch of other features as well, like probes. So you can insert probes into the CPU to get um, an idea of what's going on. Tracing, um, you can do tracing support at any level in the memory hierarchy. You can uh, connect GDB remotely to the process that's running in Gem5. Uh, dynamically linked binaries work in SE mode now, at least if you're in x86 on Linux. Um, there's some support for power modeling and PMU, um, especially for ARM stuff. And there's tons and tons of other features as well. So I want to quickly say that you know, you should take things that Gem5 says with a grain of salt. It's a tool. Um, it's not perfect. You know, models are not validated against real hardware in most cases. At least you can't guarantee that they are. And there's this really good paper, um, Architecture Simulators, Simulators Considered Harmful, that just talks about the pitfalls of using simulation in general. And of course, there are bugs in Gem5, which when you find one, I hope you commit a change and uh, fix it for us. So finally, Getting more help. Um, Gem5 Wiki, my book, which is available at learninggem5.org. Um, and then the book is also on GitHub, so if you see mistakes in the book, please um, send me a pull request. Or email me, but I would rather a pull request so I don't have to do it myself. Then the there's the mailing lists. Um, Gem5 Users is for general user questions. Gem5 Dev is mostly for code reviews. Um, we also have high level discussions of um, Gem5 directions in that as well. And then there's also this Gem5 QA, which is not the greatest place to get answers. A few people stalk it, but not me. So with that, kind of out of time. You have quick questions? Really pressing? Yeah? Okay. Gem5 support for GBU, which is edited by AMD, compared to Gem5 GBU, which is another simulator you're supporting also. So what is what 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 actually <coughs> the um, <coughs> the GPU that is in Gem5 works for HSAIL, um, AMD's intermediate language. Um, you have to use OpenCL, I believe, to compile the HSAIL. And then it um, works with Ruby. You know, they're very similar. Uh, Gem5 GPU uh, works with CUDA instead of OpenCL and uses PTX instead of HSAIL. Um, I would say the GPU model in Gen5 GPU is probably more detailed, since it's based on GPGPU sim. Um, but, 
and they have different protocols. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, we can talk more offline about specific differences. Any other questions? All right, so that's all I had. Thank you for attending. Please come this afternoon where we are going to sit down and code. This coding sprint thing is exciting, I think. So now that all of you have some exposure to how this works, how Gen 5 works, um, we have a bunch of 